Welcome to the Sanity Project Podcast, where you can awaken your mind to clarity and success even in today's life challenges. We're here to provide insights and solutions that will help you live a sane, healthy, and prosperous life. Here is your host, Joanne Victoria. Hello, everybody. This is Joanne Victoria with another amazing episode of the Sanity Project Podcast. You are here to discover a life of clarity, confidence, sanity, and entrepreneurial success. And today's guest is so good at what she does, and I'm so glad she is here. Her name is Erica Hill, and she has a book called Reset, Learn How to Grow Money and Build a Legacy. Erica is going to talk to us women, men can listen too, so that they can help the women in their lives about generational wealth. Erica Hill is a successful businesswoman that teaches other women how to build generational wealth. On her journey to creating wealth for herself, she discovered that we were deliberately programmed, listen to that one women, deliberately programmed not to be wealthy. Erica Hill's goal is to teach people how to tap into their inner, natural, abundant birthright. Erica Hill, welcome. Thank you. Hello there, Joanne. Hello. Hello, everybody. Please listen and take your notes as we're going along. Tell us a little bit, how, a bit tell the audience how you got here today. What was your background? What was your story? So with me, I actually, uh, I'm going to tell you, go, go back a little bit, a little bit. I was born, um, my, both of my parents uh, did very well in life, but they never taught me anything about money, anything about money. We didn't have conversations growing up um, at the kitchen table about money. Um, I was always taught, go to college, get a degree so you can make good money. Uh-huh. But no one taught me what to do with the money when I did go to college and get this degree. <laughs> so my freshman year in college, because I was pretty obedient, um, you know, they had uh, these credit card companies on the yard. Yes. And they were offering the college students credit cards. So I was like, I want one. And I was like 18 years old. I got approved for like $2,000, $3,000. Um, and of course, I just went and ran it up. You know, I bought all these things, jewelry, just a whole bunch of stuff. But guess what? I didn't have a job. So uh, I got a degree in business finance. And I was like the first person in my immediate family to get a degree. So I'm all excited, like, yes, walking across the stage. But guess what? Bad credit was walking with me. Mm. Um, so And, you know, I was just very ignorant. So in business finance, the first thing that they do is they check your credit. And being that my credit was not good, it took me a long time to get a job. So even I had, even though I had this degree, you know, that I was told to, you know, this is going to make you more money. You know, you're going to be successful if you get this degree. Well, I had this degree and it took me a while to find a job. Um, And then when I did find a job, people uh, that didn't have degrees were making a little bit more than I was. So my early 20s started off kind of tumultuous. Um, and being that I really didn't understand money, you know, when I did get the job, you know, I was living paycheck to paycheck and, you know, uh, Robin Paul to pay Peter. Like I was just, I was just in a financial roller coaster. Um, and what happened is I landed a job in the mortgage comp- in the mortgage business. And I would see people like my age, buying houses and doing all these amazing things. So I'm like, I want to do it too. So like at 27, I went and bought my first property um, and I changed my whole trajectory around when it came to money because I got a chance to see money from a different perspective. And eventually I went and started my own mortgage company. Hmm. But what I realized is that it costs us so much in life not to understand how money works. And I didn't have a class in college or elementary school, high school, middle school about money. Uh, My parents didn't teach me about money. Um, So, you know, how do you learn? And the reason to fast forward, you know, I actually now own a financial service agency. And 
I was reading some statistics and they said it's over 7.5 billion people in the world. But out of that 7.5 billion people, there's only 30% of those people that's financially literate. So that means it's over 5 billion people in the world that are financially illiterate. So that's a problem. That, that's a huge problem. So that was one of the reasons why I wrote the book. But what I realized is that we were programmed to fail. Like our natural state is abundance. You know, our natural birthright is abundance, but we were programmed to fail. That's not coincidental that there's over 5 billion people in the world that don't really understand money. That's intentional. How is that intentional? Think about it. When did you have a, a money class when you were in, in school? Did you? Oh no, I I'm right along with you. Nobody told me anything. The, exactly. In, in our family, uh, it was you. We either had money or we didn't have the money. I mean, it was a, a a different thing. But you know, I look at it as I had a place to sleep. I had food on the table, and um, you learn by what goes on in your family, right? First. Yeah. And um, I came from, it was just my brother and myself, and my parents came from nothing and made something out of themselves and, you know, took care of us. But the money talk never happened. The money school never happened. The money class never happened um, for not anyone I know. Uh, you know, it, it just didn't. And mm -hmm. I, I think that blindness towards money creates problems. Yeah, yeah. Intentional. Why? I, I know for me in school, I was taught geometry. I was taught trigonometry. I was taught algebra. Things I don't even know. Like, now, I don't know anything about a, an equation or anything. Like, seriously, why would they teach you things that you really won't use? Like, I old, didn't. Yeah, old patterns, old information geared towards uh, helping men get jobs in the engineering world. I have no idea. You know, look, looking at it, is, it is a disaster, and yeah. it's still a disaster. Yeah. I don't think much has changed in far as far as what they teach children in school today. It's still, it's not much beyond reading, writing, and arithmetic, and the arithmetic is kind of pale. It's just kind of loose and goosey. Yeah. So, uh, you know, who, I don't know. You don't need some of the things that you mentioned until you get to college and make a choice on a career in that particular uh, specialty. But why do you need it in elementary school or even high school? Exactly. You, you, you need to learn how to live in it. They used to call it in, what did they call it in school? I'm thinking back to some things that I've read about economics. Yeah. So yeah. they used to teach women, girls, ladies, girls, how to cook, and then they used to teach boys how to, um, what did they have? Uh, shop, the home economics and the shop, shop. class where you would make things, yes. ashtrays and different things. Yeah. 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 I don't even think they have that anymore. You know, nothing, pra nothing practical was taught in school. Yeah. Yeah. But those are things that we need to know because that's a part of your life. That's your day-to-day -day living. Yes. Like that's your day to day living. So why is it not taught in schools? Like the, that's the formative. Those are the formative uh, learning years in school. And they're not teaching you the basic things that's going to take you throughout life. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. And it's intentional. It is intentional. It is intentional because that's how the rich get richer and the poor stay poor because they don't understand. Um, okay, so no that is that what you're saying when you say it's intentional that these yes! five billion people? Yes! Okay. Yes, so, yes, yes, yes. Okay, because yes. that I want the listeners to hear more about that. Yes, this yes, intentionality yes. that is. Um, I agree with you. I just want you to speak the words, speak to the words, so that people can hear and make up their own minds as to why they don't know squat about taking care of their paycheck. Yes, yes, yes. It's intentional. It is intentional. It is definitely intentional. And the thing about it, Joanne, is we're so like our, the brain operates in two ways. Uh, you're either going to be in the default mode, which is like an auto, I call it autopilot. You don't even have to think about it. You're like on autopilot. Everything you do is just kind of on autopilot or direct. And that's when you're in the present moment 
and you're intentional with your thoughts. So if you grew up in a family, you know, where money was scarce, um, you know, and all you heard was money doesn't grow on trees. Money is the root of all evil. We can't afford that. Put that back. But you never, no one actually sat down and taught you what to do with money. But the conversations that were around you were all scarce. Nine times out of 10, that's reflected in your bank account right now as an adult. Mm -hmm. And we don't realize that. We don't realize that. A, a lot of times, too, it's reflected in the way that you see money and the way that you speak about money. Um, you could be having lack conversations when it comes to money and you don't even realize it because in your subconscious mind, it's programmed. It's on, auto, it's on default because of things that you heard as a child. But no one actually talks about that. It just becomes your regular way of living. You know, no pattern is interrupted. You never re really even think about it. And the sad part about it is a lot of times we get to our retirement age and we realize that, you know, wow, I've been working since I was 18 years old. Um, I'm 77 now and I don't have anything to show for it because you never understood how many work. You never understood how many work. And the average person for some reason, they don't reach out to financial professionals. They try to wing it and do it on their own. They'll uh, there, there, there's probably some shame involved. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, ignorance, of course. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think those two things cover it because, you know, who knew who? If you're in that kind of a situation and you're you know a normal person, whatever that means, average person, let's say that might be a better def definition. You you will probably be unaware that there are financial services uh, people out there who will help you with your money, with your paycheck, with your retirement, yes. besides what they show on the TV, because yes. what they show on TV is all bupkis anyway. So Yes, 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 exactly, exactly. They'll wing it, you know, they'll talk to friends, they'll YouTube it, they'll read books, but they never actually sit down to let someone, a professional look at what they have going on to, to let them know, you know, are your money, is your money even in the right accounts? Um, I did a challenge a while back. It was a five day money challenge. And I actually was talking to the women about compounding interest. And it was so funny, Joanne, I would say 95% of the women in the challenge never heard of it. Oh, never heard of it. My goodness. Never heard of it. And Albert Einstein states, states that compounding interest is one of the greatest wonders of the world. They knew who Albert Einstein was, but they never heard of compounding interest. That's an issue. Well, I hope they started uh, yeah. Yeah. making it work yeah. by putting money in. I mean, it's amazing. You know, one penny a day. Well, there are stati statistics out there that prove that over a certain period of time, one money, one penny a day uh, deposited into your savings account compounded generates an untold unknown sum of money. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. It compounds over time. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it compounds over time. But if you don't, if you've been taught to, you know, get a good job, pay your bills on time, put your money in a savings account, you are doomed. <laughs> you are doomed because in the 70s, uh, in the 60s, you know, a lot of people actually put their money in a savings account. But if you're doing that now, the banks are paying less than like one, two percent interest on your money. Um, so if they're paying only one to two percent interest your money's not growing you're putting your money in a vehicle that's not working for you it's not growing at all but the average person has their money either a in a savings account in their 401k and that's oh. what they're depending on for retirement yeah 401k is terrible yeah yeah it just yeah. eats up all of your profits and people don't understand about that either there's just so much to to know and 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 to learn about that it's um it's like when banks even borrow money, people don't know that they borrow money at zero interest because they don't yeah. have to pay interest on the money because you're going to pay them yeah. what they need to cover their butts when the yeah. money's called. Oh, it's just, it's such a mess. Yeah. 
So but Joanne, think about this, okay? So you're giving them your money to hold for you, okay? Let's just hypothetically say you have $100,000 sitting in the savings account. They're paying you, blah, blah, mm, I'm going to say 2%, which they're not. It's really like 1% and really less than that. But we're going we're gonna to like say 2%. They're giving you 2% interest to hold your hard money, okay, in their account. But when you go back to them and you need a loan, credit card, mortgage, car note, they're going to charge you anywhere between 6 to 25% and sometimes higher than that. So they're giving you less like 2% to hold your money. But when you go to them to ask for money, they charge you a ridiculous amount in interest. Now, one of the things that I had the women do, because I wanted them to see, like, no, I don't want you to listen to me. I want you to actually to see it. I had them, I taught them about the rule of 72. And I had them go back because the rule of 72 will actually show you how long it will take for your money to double according to whatever interest rate that they're paying. So I had them look at their account, look at the interest rate and apply the rule of 72. Then I had them take that same method use the rule of 72 and look at what they're charging you in interest to see how quick their money is going to double. And they were floored, Joey. <laughs> they were floored. Oh my God, it's going to take me 20 years, 30 years for my money to double. But oh my God, they're doubling my money in like seven, six years. I'm like, exactly. Yeah. So for the people who are listening who do not know what the rule of 72 is, they can look it up, of course, but would you give a bottom line description of what the rule of 72 is? Sure. So the rule of 72 states that, let's say, hypothetically speaking, your interest rate is 6%. You would take 6% and divide it by 72, and it will show you how long it's going to take for your money to double. So you take the interest rate divided by 72 and it'll tell you, it'll show you like how long it's going to take for that money to double in that account. Okay. Did you get that everyone that are listening? I know some of you are saying, Joanne, I already know that, but not all of you do. So I, I always call out my uh, audience because I want them to pay attention. If I call out my audience, it'll open their ears a little bit more and they will pay attention. You need to know where your money goes, how it gets there, how your money is used in the lending institutions. And we will be kind in calling them lending institutions. I mean, the banks got us into 2008. People don't remember that. They choose to forget that. Wall Street and the banks, if it weren't for them, that destabilized our country. Huge. I mean, I know there are always, you know, there's, it's cyclical when we always have problems because it reaches, um, it reaches a, a, a place where it's too full and things have to settle down so that we have another dump and dive. But I think 2008 was pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Very bad. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, like we were saying, for those that actually have their money in a 401k and they actually experienced 2008, you can't afford, if, especially if you're like in your 40s and 50s, you can't afford for your money to be on a roller coaster. Mm -hmm. um, because if the market crashes or it dips down, you don't have a lot of recovery time with your money. But a lot of people don't understand that. Another thing, too, is they're waiting to retire uh, with the 401k, not understanding the money that you have in your account. You don't have that because you're going to be taxed. So if you have $100,000 in your 401k, depending on the age that you actually retire, uh, you're going to be paid taxes on that. So hypothetically speaking, uh, if you're like 59 and up, that's 20% for now. We don't know what taxes are going to be in the next 10, 25 years. We don't even know what it's going to be five years. So instead of that 100000 guess what? It's dwindled down to $80,000. So people have to take that into consideration and understand like, okay, wait a minute. Um, what am I doing here? You know, is this the best strategy for me? Especially when you're talking about retirement and to know how much money am I going to need to live off comfortably at retirement age? Um, I realize that's another conversation that a lot of women don't have. Mm -hmm. We're just like, oh, yeah, I'm going to retire at the age of 
65. Okay. So how much money do you, are you going to need to live comfortably? Huh? Uh, let me think about that. Mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. That's a good question. I don't know. I'm like, wow. So we're out here just really winging it when it comes to our finances and we really can't afford to do that. Well, I think that if everybody, instead of, uh, investing in their 401k, put all that money aside and bought a small house somewhere and rented it. By the time they retired, the house could be almost paid off for and they would have income. Yep. 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 And yep. it's then people go, well, I can't afford to buy a house. Well, sometimes you can't afford not to. Exactly. It's, you exactly. know, exactly. And that's, that's your investment, not your 401k, because it's, it's, it's beneficial to buy a piece of property, even if it's a small piece of property, that you rent out to somebody else. You don't have to live in it. You know, you rent it out, and then 15 years later, y- you don't owe that much on the property, and you've got income coming in. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you refinance, you get a lot right now. Refinances are good, right? And. Yeah. They're as much as you can get in a, in a savings account, one, two-ish percent. But people are not trained on how to build wealth. Yes, yes, yes. And the, the importance of having multiple streams of income. Right. Um, because the average person was taught to get a job, you know, get a job. And if you get a job, there's nothing wrong with you getting a job, but you don't want to have that being your only source of income. Because when you lose that job, you're going to be in trouble. So you always want to have, I always say your money should have legs to it. It should, I always say, send it out and bring me more friends back. (laughs) I'm going to send you out into the world and I want you to come back with more friends. Like your money should have an assignment. It should always have an assignment. And you should always have uh, multiple streams. Never depend on just one stream because you're setting yourself up for failure. And COVID actually showed us that. Like COVID actually, there was a lot of um, awareness behind COVID, but some people were still operating in, um, with blinders on. And, and it's just, it can be sad sometimes, Joanne. Yeah, and anybody who has a, a nine to five ish kind of job uh, has plenty of time to have a side hustle of some sort to generate some income from another source than the job. The job is limiting. The job, um, and, and, and as you say, with COVID right now, people went, oh, look at that. I didn't know about that. Okay. You know, yeah. some put their blinders back on. Some moved them off one eye and looked at, peeked out and went, oops, I'm going back under yeah. the blanket. And then others, yet others, pulled the blinders right off and looked at COVID as an opportunity yeah. to start their own business. Yes, 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 exactly. Exactly. It depends on what's important in life for some people, but I think for for women, money is freedom. Yeah. And money gives you opportunities to do many, many things. And if you have an unending supply of money from, you know, several trails of, of whatever it might be, several baskets, um, you have choices. And I think freedom and choices are really important. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. But with the freedom and choices, you got to become aware of how you actually see money, because a lot of times we have blocks around money and we don't realize that at the end of the day, money is an energy. We all are energy and you're either going to repel it or you're going to attract it. Right. And you are the source of money. You're the source. You are the one that's behind the money. Money doesn't have the only time money has money. The only power that money has is the power you give over it. For instance, if you actually have a job in corporate America and you're making, let's say, sixty, seventy thousand dollars. Guess what? You're the one that decided that you wanted to make sixty, seventy thousand dollars. The job paid that, but you're the one that decided that I'm going to take it. You didn't have to take that. So you're the one that's the source behind it. Yeah, people don't, again, there's so many things that we can discuss, and I'm sure you discuss some of these things in your Facebook group. Uh, For those listening, this is a good place to get in in touch with Erica Hill. Uh, She has a group called Create Your Fabulous Life, not 
Difficult to Understand, Create Your Fabulous Life. It's a group on Facebook, and I will also make sure that it is on uh, the page right here where Erica Hill's episode is is living. It's residing on my website and in many other locations. But if you come back to my website, you will see that it's there, Create Your Fabulous Life. So give our listeners... Oh, a couple of three things that they can do right now today to help them create more wealth and to learn about what they need to learn about? One thing I would say is get with a financial professional. Get with a financial professional and let them see if you have the basic financial principles set up for your account. Um, Make sure that you're on track to... uh, that you're on track with whatever your financial goals are. Like you got to get with a financial professional because they understand and they know things that the average person doesn't. So you always want to have a financial professional um, on your team. Um, Another thing I would tell you is to, you know, start to take financially literate, financial literacy uh, as something that's important. Learn more, learn more about it. You know, If you see different classes that, you know, people are offering or things of that nature, jump into it, get into the conversation, you know, learn more about it. And then the third thing I would say is watch your community, like be in a community of people that are movers and shakers. Um, Make sure that your community surrounding you are people that's doing the things in life that you want to do. Because if you're around five broke people, guess what? You're going to be six. (laughs) <laughs> you're going to be the six. You're going to be the six. So you want to make sure and you want to be very intentional about who you surround yourself with. Those are great tips and strategies. I hope everybody is listening and taking notes. I would recommend to the listeners that you re-listen to this podcast because Erica Hill has given uh, a great deal of information and you can connect with her on Facebook at Create Your Fabulous Life. And those of you who do not want to connect with her on Facebook, uh, her email address is info at, oh, excuse me, ask at erica-hill.com. Real simple, ask at erica-hill.com. And then Erica will respond to you. So I want to thank you, Erica Hill, for being here today. This has been a very important session, especially for women, about money. Uh, and I'm, I'm grateful that you were here to share your story with them and also to give them some strategies that they can implement today and be more in charge of their own lives because that's what it's really all about. Thank you so much, Joanne, for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I had a great time as well. I want to tell those who are listening that they can go to my website at askjoannevictoria.com slash podcasts and get your free copy of the True Self Handbook, A Guide to Transform Your Life. Everybody stay happy. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Sanity Project Podcast. Please go to askjoannevictoria.com to listen to more podcasts. Check out Joanne's coaching programs and get a free copy of her report, Five Steps to Achieve Life Work Harmony. That's AskJoanneVictoria.com. Take care and thanks for being here.